Okay, so before we start this episode, we would just like to remind all of our listeners uh, to go ahead and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. We would also love it if you like left a comment. We love reading all your comments. And we'd also just like to remind our listeners that we do have a Patreon account if you would like to support our show. We love all of our lovely, lovely Patreons. <laughs> they get exclusive access to polls where they get to choose our future topics so my next topic was chosen by our patreons um so if you would like to become a history hero and support our show we would greatly appreciate it and yeah hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of how did we not know that i'm nat i'm jack and today yeah i don't remember what jack's episode is about but i know she's super excited so hated doing the research for this because it took me over two weeks to kind of figure it out because it was so complex and confusing to me but I summarized it and I've got it ready for you guys today so it should be really fun because it's probably one of the most important events in history and it'll clear up world war one. Oh my gosh I take that back it won't clear up world war one but it's just <laughs> like <laughs> it'll it'll be like um it's a stepping stone to World War One. So I'm covering the Balkan Wars, and those are two successive military conflicts that split up the rest of the Ottoman Empire into all of its remaining territories in Eastern Europe, which is in the Balkan Peninsula. It's like Southeastern Europe. If you're listening, I know we're a podcast, but if you have a chance, please go look up the Balkans on a map because it'll help <laughs> you understand what's happening a lot better. I also had to look at a map while I was doing research before it finally clicked, but I'll do my best to explain the geography and location of these countries. So if you don't have a map, hopefully you can envision it a little better. To start with, the geography. So the Balkans (laughs) are also known as the Balkan Peninsula, and those are located in southeastern Europe. And some key geographical landmarks are the Balkan mountain range, which stretches all the way through Bulgaria. And then the Black Sea is to the east of the area. So these are the countries that are between the Adriatic Sea on the left and then the Black Sea on the right. Gotcha. I should say west and east. The west (laughs) and the east. The left and right if you look at the map. (laughs) Um, sorry about that yeah black sea is to the east italy is towards the west and Mm. the adriatic sea is towards the west and then the austro-hungarian empire is to the north and turkey would be to the south of the region okay that little block in there yeah yeah okay let's go back to the 1800s to start and surprise surprise the ottomans which are from turkey if anyone didn't know they had ruled the Balkan Peninsula for roughly 500 to 600 years. And each area of the Balkans, like much of the world, has its own diverse group of people and cultures. And in the 1800s, we start to see a rise of nationalism in different regions of the Balkans throughout that time period. (laughs) (laughs) And the countries start to have wars and claim their independence. The first country to claim independence is actually Greece in 1832, which I didn't realize Greece was in the Balkans until I started doing this. Yeah, wait, uh, why did I think that was like more towards the West? Yeah, they're in the Balkans, and the Ottoman Empire ruled them, if you didn't know. So, Greece claims their independence in 1832, and that's followed by Montenegro and Serbia. They also get their independence, and then Bulgaria gets partial independence for a while. And then we hit the 1900s. Oh, also, side note, the main countries involved in this conflict that we're going to talk about a lot are going to be Greece, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and Serbia. Okay. And then later we'll hear about a few other countries, but it's mostly going to be those four that make up the Balkan League. So in the 1900s, this is where it is probably useful for you to get a map. Let me pull up one, actually. Can I? Is that okay? Yeah, (laughs) please do. (laughs) Just do, like, (laughs) Balkans in the 1900s, because then you can see, like, what land is still Ottoman, and then what land is independent. Ah, okay. Gotcha. We're set. 
Okay, so the early 1900s are when the events really start to heat up. So in July of 1908, there is an important event in the Ottoman Empire known as the Young Turk Revolution, where a group of revolutionists overthrew the authoritarian regime of the Ottoman Empire. And this is significant because the new rulers, so the Young Turks, their handling of foreign affairs eventually leads to the downfall of the empire, you could say. Yikes. It, that might be an oversimplification, mm. but, you know, after that switch of power, that's when, you know, territory losses happen. In October of 1908, Bulgaria gains its full independence, and their new ruler, Tsar Ferdinand, starts building up a large army, which is a bit of foreshadowing, okay? So Bulgaria, as soon as they're independent, they start building up their defense. Yikes. And in 1911 to 1912, the Kingdom of Italy decide that they want to conquer some territories that are ruled by the Ottomans in North Africa. So they attack in the Italo-Turkish War, and they end up actually easily conquering the Ottoman colonies in North Africa. Wow, really? And the significance of the Italo-Turkish War, besides conquering Ottoman colonies, is that after seeing how weakened the Ottomans were, the Balkan states, which were nearby, became even more nationalistic. Ah. Uh, so then they probably are, like, confident in their own independence movements. They're like, oh, they're not even... They can't even hold on to like the territory they have now. So if we try to if we try to leave, like if we try to bounce, it should probably be okay. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like now is the time. Also, like if you're a country and you're like, okay, let's claim our own independence, and then you see like, hey, Bulgaria gain these new territories easily, you're probably also going to be like, hey, we might as well try to gain some new territories as well. Foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. <laughs> You're right on it. <laughs> now we're going to talk about a little country called Albania. Ah. One of the Balkan states, Albania, mm. is not independent yet. And they start to revolt against the Ottomans more frequently once the Young Turks take over in 1908. For your geographical visualization, if you don't have a map, Albania is east of the Kingdom of Italy, which is an independent nation. It's separated by the Adriatic Sea. And then to the north of Albania is Montenegro another independent nation <laughs> and then to the south is greece also yeah. an independent nation uh, where modern day macedonia would be is still ruled by the ottomans until you hit serbia and bulgaria which are also independent so you can see why with their placement they feel a little more <laughs> motivated to become independent as well yeah before the italo turkish war ends so they're still the ottomans are still fighting the italians albania is really motivated by seeing how easily Italy is winning. So in January of 1912, they have a final revolt against the Ottomans, which turns into a full-fledged war and ends in September of 1912 when the Ottomans agree to fulfill the Albanian rebel demands. Wow. It's progress. Okay, yeah. So it's really fast, actually. And yeah. Albania is still not fully independent at this point, but they will get their full independence on November 28th of that same year, only a few months later. Hmm. Ah, uh, okay. Wait, a few months later. Wow, okay. So that, like, that moves fast. Yeah, it happened in one year, less than a year. <laughs> yeah, so the Ottoman Empire is, like, really, really weak. Yeah, they're a lot weaker now. Now we're going to get into the thick of okay. the conversation. Not that that <laughs> other stuff wasn't thick, but these uh, are, like, the four big ones. So Serbia, Bulgaria, Greece, and Montenegro. Before we get to the point of Albania becoming independent in November, let's reel it back a little, just a few months, and we're going to redirect our attention to the other Balkan states. So, to the direct east of Montenegro, like I said, we have a bit of Ottoman territory still, and that's just like a sliver between Montenegro and Serbia. And then to the east, we'll have Serbia, of course, we hit that. And then to the east of Serbia, we directly hit Bulgaria. And then south of both Serbia and Bulgaria is still the Ottoman Empire, like we said, that Macedonian area. And and after seeing the Kingdom of Italy's success and the Albanian revolt, Bulgaria starts thinking, we could probably conquer more Ottoman territory. And Serbia agrees with this. <laughs> so, Serbia and Bulgaria sign a military alliance treaty in early 1912, where they agree to unite against their common enemies, mainly the Ottomans, but also the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which is to the north of them. Ah. Yeah, and there's a lot of beef between them, which I was picking up on, but I don't really know uh. how thick that goes. And actually, the conflict between the Balkans and the Austro-Hungarian is a huge 
uh, cause of World War One apparently, but I don't know enough about it. So I would yeah. love to do a follow up and research more into it. <laughs> I'll get into it at the end. But um, they had signed similar treaties to this a bit earlier in 1904, but the significance of the 1912 treaty is that that starts the formation of the Balkan League, which is the quadruple alliance between the Balkan states, and that's Bulgaria, okay. Serbia, Greece, and Montenegro. And then the 1912 alliance between Serbia and Bulgaria, they agree to work together to conquer Ottoman territory, and they're going to split Macedonia between them after the war, so North Macedonia is supposed to go to Serbia and South Macedonia is going to go to Bulgaria. Greece and Montenegro eventually also enter the alliance because mm. they also don't like the Ottomans. <laughs> <laughs> They're all united against a common enemy. So eventually Greece and Montenegro join and they fully form the Balkan League. Each country has a goal to expand their territory. Montenegro wants to go east, Serbia and Bulgaria want to go south, and Greece wants to go north. So Montenegro is the first country to declare war against the Ottomans, which is kind of funny to me because they're the smallest. (laughs) It's so tiny. I have a question really quick. The members of the Balkan League, did they all agree on like which areas they were kind of scouting out? It's a spoiler. Yeah, Serbia and Bulgaria for sure agreed. They signed a treaty together and agreed to split Macedonia. Gotcha. But the other two was not clear, and that that might be why we get some issues. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Um, Anyways, they, yeah, so Montenegro is the first country to declare war against the Ottomans on October 9th of 1912, which, remember, the Italo-Ottoman War is still going on at this time in October. Oh, wow. The Albanians had just won their war in September, and now in October, Montenegro declares war on the Ottomans as well. Yikes, I would not want to be in charge. A few days later, on the 17th of October, just before the Italians make peace with the Ottomans, the rest of the Balkan League, Greece, Bulgaria, and Serbia, all join in on the war. (laughs) Oh my gosh. So Greece, this is like a key point, literally this came up in every single research piece I was looking at, but Greece had a very strong navy and that prevented the Ottomans from being able to get to Europe and attack the countries through the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this allowed the Balkans to make quick gains against the Ottomans. Yeah. And in one month's time, very quickly, the Balkans seized most of their intended territories, with one of the most significant gains being Bulgaria's conquering of Adrianople, which was a very sacred and religious city for Ottomans. All right. And that's in current day Turkey? Yes. Spoiler alert. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. (laughs) Sorry, yeah, so Adrian <laughs> Yeah, like, so Bulgaria takes it, and then we'll see what happens to okay. it. Obviously, they didn't hold on to it that long if it's not theirs anymore. Gotcha. So then we'll go back to Albanians' independence and the end of the First Balkan War. On November 28th, like we said, Albania declares its full independence. Conflict continues with the Balkan League. And the Bulgaria attempts to also take Constantinople, which is the capital city of the Ottoman Empire at the time, but they failed to do mm. so. Fun fact, Constantinople later gets renamed to Istanbul, if you've ever heard the one song. Do you remember that song? It's like Istanbul, Constantinople. Constantinople. So that's a really easy way to remember it. Um, But yeah, so Constantinople is where present day Istanbul would be. And time goes on and each Balkan League country is taking more territory. And Greece actually ends up conquering a little further north and Serbia conquers a little further south than Bulgaria is expecting, which cuts into the southern Macedonian territory that Bulgaria wanted. Hmm, okay. So let's see how they felt about Uh that. Yeah, I have a feeling. It doesn't go over well. Right? And he's like, no, you guys can have it, that's fine. That's like, okay, I'm sorry, but like, this Balkan League, like, even from the get-go, obviously there are going to be issues. Like, hey, it's a tiny region... And you're like, oh, I'm going to conquer this area. Like, I don't know, four countries who are searching for territory in the same region at the same time. Of course, there's going to be some overlaps and some disagreements. Yeah, I'm sure organization-wise, communication wasn't all there the entire time. Yeah. Anyway, so Bulgaria is not happy about this, and Greece and Serbia start worrying about Bulgaria aggression against them. Oh my god. 
So by May of 1913, the Balkan League had successfully driven the Ottomans out of Macedonia and various other surrounding territories. And on May 30th, the Ottomans and the Balkan League sign a peace treaty known as the Treaty of London, and this officially ends the First Balkan War. But Bulgaria feels really cheated on the territory, and there are already more signs of Bulgarian aggression and intentions to expand and take more territory. Keep in mind these dates too. So May 30th is when that treaty gets signed. Hmm. And Bulgaria is clearly angry. Serbia and Greece are feeling a little nervous. (laughs) Yeah. A little stressed. And so Greece and Serbia (laughs) sign an alliance together on June 1st. The next day. Oh my gosh. A day after the war just ended and they solidify their borders <sighs> together because the new territory of Serbia and Greece now border each other and they like cut through. Yeah, okay. So they solidify their borders on the territory and agree to back each other up if Bulgaria attacks. Wow, all right. The next day they're like, okay, we got to start preparing. Right yeah, <laughs> so the threat of another war is really imminent. Now we get into the Second Balkan War because there were two. So (laughs) Bulgaria is continuing to grow more aggressive with intentions to expand. And this is a little random, but Romania, which is located to the north of Bulgaria, is also starting to feel a little threatened by Bulgaria. So anyways, Romania warns that if Bulgaria starts another war, it's not going to stay neutral. Like Romania is going to get involved. So... Tsar Ferdinand, the ruler of Bulgaria, commands the army without the approval of the rest of the Bulgarian government. And remember, Tsar Ferdinand is the... Oh! Yeah, he's the ruler of Bulgaria, and he was the one that was building up that army. Ah, okay, okay. He commands the army to invade southern Serbia without warning on June 16th, 1913, and this starts the Second Balkan War. That was just a little over two weeks after the First Balkan War ended. (laughs) God. Everything is moving so fast. It's crazy because it happened so fast and then you get World War One. So it's just <laughs> like so this much conflict. Oh my gosh. Right. So Montenegro also sides with Greece and Serbia and they all start fighting against Bulgaria. Now Bulgaria is the one that's getting beat up a little bit. Yeah, now they switch their focus from Ottoman Empire to Bulgaria. <laughs> like, actually, now we're pissed at you. <laughs> right, and they were just alliances two weeks ago. This is crazy. Yeah, so now they're all fighting. And then on the 10th of July, Romania enters into the war as well against Bulgaria. <laughs> and they easily capture territory in the north of Bulgaria with little to no resistance. Wow. Because... Bulgaria is literally getting beat up yeah. on, the, like, the West. Just everyone. They're all ganging up on a different... Yeah, different parts <laughs> like of it. Power. Yeah, things are pretty rough for Bulgaria right mm. now. And seeing how caught up Bulgaria is with getting attacked by four different countries, yeah. the Ottomans notice, and they decide that they want to go back and get their lost territory. <laughs> no way. Yeah. So they're convinced that they can easily win against Bulgaria if they attacked right now. So on July 20th, they also invade Bulgaria. Oh my god. So now Bulgaria, you have the map out. You yeah. can see they're literally surrounded. <laughs> like, not only do they completely get pushed out of Serbia, but they start losing territory and the Ottomans take back Adrianople. Because oh, yeah. remember it was a sacred city. So they ha- they conquered this extra land and then Ottomans took it right back. And then the Ottomans Apparently, historically, I haven't done a ton of research on this, but I know that they were very aggressive and committed a lot of genocides and atrocities Mm -hmm. against the people in that region. So it's really sad, but um, after they took back Adrianople, then they committed more atrocities against the Bulgarians in that region. Very sad. And, or at least, like, continued to or became more aggressive. Mm. But finally, on August 12th of 1913, which is less than two months after the war started, the Treaty of Bucharest gets signed and ratified, and that ends the Second Balkan War. And then Macedonia got divided up after that point. Okay. In summary, the results of the Balkan Wars. So the Balkan War really sets the stage for World War I, Mm. like we were talking about. And by the end of both wars, Bulgaria had increased its territory by about 16%, so it did gain more land, but at what cost? Yeah, do you have, like, the casualties? Like, the number of casualties? No, I don't. I don't know. If you want to Google it, feel free. Okay, I just looked it up on International Encyclopedia. It says the Balkan War, the Bulgarians lost around 65,000 men, 
the Greeks 9,500, the Montenegrins 3,000, and the Serbs at least 36,000. The Ottomans lost as many as 125,000. Okay, so that's good. Well, not good. good. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. That's that's an interesting reaction. I'm so sorry. And this is from the International Encyclopedia of the First World War. So they didn't lose as much as the Ottomans, but they lost a lot. Yeah, the Ottomans lost quite a lot. The Serbs also lost. How much did they, what were the Serbs? 36. Compared to, so Ottomans was most at 125,000. Yeah, Bulgarians is like twice that, though. Yeah. Yeah, Bulgarian was around 65,000. Yeah. War is not good for anyone. Yeah, and especially, like, the population is so small. Yeah, that's the thing is, like, we're just, like, looking at the maps and, like, I just can't imagine. Everything is so happening so quickly. So, like, if you're someone living in the region at the time and, like, every day you're at war with, like, a different person and, like, the borders are just constantly changing and then they're like, okay, today this is our enemy. Now, tomorrow, this is going to be our enemy. Like, that must be so chaotic i can't even imagine yeah not only is like okay we had two wars like two balkan wars two wars in the region and then (laughs) you go from that right into world war one so much conflict in this region for a good cause right they want their independence right and they want to expand yeah yeah they want their independence but then they're like we want a little little yeah (laughs) well i kind of i mean i can empathize even on a scale these are countries and we're kind of reducing talking about them as if they're people but even you can empathize on a person scale that if you had an agreement with one person (laughs) and then someone else who wasn't in that agreement kind of takes a little more and the person you had an agreement with doesn't back you up you would feel hurt too so yeah of course it just it sucks for them yeah okay but also too so this is another key point that although they gained the land, Bulgaria is still pretty unhappy afterwards, so much so mm. that they end up joining the Central Powers in World War One, which is a huge deal. Really? Just because petty? They're just, like, petty that everyone turned against? Well, not petty. Well, no, I don't want to say petty. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah, they're just petty. You're just not. No, like, I mean, like... their whole allies turned against yeah. them. And that that is, like, I mean, that's a small note, but I think that that's, huge to think about how affected the country was because the bulgarians joined the central powers for anyone who doesn't know in world war one is the austro-hungarian empire the ottomans germany the thing is like bulgaria is so upset that they join with the austro-hungarian empire and ottomans which are two of the biggest enemies that's how upset they are that they go to the other side i i see it like i can understand though like they literally they're like wait every they're like hold up i thought our enemy was the ottoman empire than everyone <laughs> but i mean they turn on them for a reason that's still hard for me to like get because i get like you're so upset with them but the ottomans literally are like torturing and yeah. killing your people and the austro-hungarians also mm. are like oppressive against them that's so how it's crazy to me yeah. that they join yeah. i yeah, mm. i wonder because like you're talking about how like everyone like nationalism is really strong at the time so it could just be pride and like yeah and it could just be like czar ferdinand who knows like may this isn't all the people uh, yeah it could just be him just the one like whoever is leading the country at the time is just they're making those decisions and everyone else yeah. has to follow along too man that's just like how quickly everything happened in succession is insane to me it's nuts but then okay so also Mm. after seeing how the balkan forces quickly defeated the ottoman army driving them out of almost all of southeastern europe the great european powers which are britain france germany austria hungary and russia scramble to also start gaining control over the ottoman region (laughs) and if if you guys remember the episode the israeli palestinian conflict you know that during this time actually britain um conquers palestine it was like world war one time and they end up taking more territory from the ottomans and that's when they get palestine so it's a it's a huge domino effect it's really interesting yeah that's crazy and (laughs) apparently some german warlord his name was kaiser wilhelm wrote a letter Mm -hmm. after the balkan wars to the austro-hungarian foreign minister in october of 1913 
And he said that the war between the East and the West was inevitable and that the Slavs are born not to rule but to obey. Yikes. Yeah. Probably a big part of World War One that I didn't realize. I hate to end on a downer, but yeah, we're going to... That's the end of it. <laughs> that's, that's, this, the that's the end. That's the summary of my notes for the Balkan <laughs> Wars and to be continued wow. and... Yeah, such a juicy topic. Wow. That was really, it really did kind of feel like gossip at one point. Like, I don't know, they all, like, are just ganging up on different yeah. people. Well, you start to think I'm of like, them as, like, like individuals, yeah. like, characters. <laughs> yeah. And then even just looking at a map, like, I don't know, I was, like, looking at a map just thinking about, like, okay, like, just geographically, like, how are the borders changing? But then you also have to think about the people living there, and that's, like, why there are all these ethnic tensions between different nations and conflict ensues like, yeah. through, throughout the next 100 years. So thank you so much, Jack. You did a great job. You did a really good job at, like, explaining and breaking that down, and, like, I feel like I followed pretty well. So thank you for explaining that clearly. And, yeah, yeah, thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye. This has been an episode of How Did We Not Know That? If you liked it, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. You can also follow us on all social media, including YouTube, at How Did We Not Know That? If you thought our podcast was low quality, we know. We thought so too. Help us improve the podcast by contributing to our Patreon. Thank you for listening and see you guys next week.